I hate both phrases, toxic masculinity and toxic femininity. And you know, the piece that I wrote for Quillette, I think was called On Toxic Femininity, to, to make the point right up front, um, you know, before I got into it in the piece, that this, that this was going to be that conversation, or at least a very small part of it, actually. There's, there's a lot, lot more to say about it. Um, which is that, um, and, and I guess I would also, there's a lot more to be said, and I would want to really separate out over in toxic masculinity space the stuff that a subset of men do that is actually toxic, to use this, this word that is problematic, which is also a problematic word now, um, and the things that men are more likely to do and that some people don't like it, but, but deal with it, right? So, you know, being more likely to maybe interrupt in a conversation, um, being more likely to take risks. This is a more masculine way of being, on average, and I don't... Well, boisterousness in school, boisterousness for example, is often medicated out of boys. Right, very much so. So that, you know, that's a whole other conversation, but absolutely. You know, the fact that the schools are designed for girl ways of learning. The schools mostly are not designed for boy ways of learning, and so boys get slapped and corralled and told to sit in straight rows and look forward at the teacher and take nice notes when they're probably closer to illegible handwriting than the girls have. That's not doing boys any any um, any good. Um, so you know, actual toxic male behavior. So I would say that you know most men on average will display some of the stuff that most men tend to are more likely to be boisterous than most women and, and all of this. But um, but aggressing, you know, being violent, aggressing, pushing in in the sexual sphere. This is what toxic masculinity should mean, right? Like this, this is what that should refer to. So if that's true, then over in the toxic femininity sphere, um, what, what kinds of things are on average women are more likely to do? But this is just a more fe feminine, a more female way of being. They're more likely to, to be in groups, same sex groups and talk as opposed to do. Like men are more likely to get together and do and women are more likely to get together and, and talk. I think, on average, and maybe they're doing something at the same time, you know, some, some kind of craft or, or, or eating together, and men are more likely to you know, like go out and play a game or build something or fix a car, and that's, you know, very stereotypical, but it's also true. Um, so in that talking, there is the building of relationship, and there is also the building of kind of storytelling, some of which is true and some of which isn't. Uh, and so people will complain about sort of women tending to be gossipy the way that we'll complain about men not sharing their feelings. And I would say those are sort of equivalent in terms of like those are just like actually somewhat stereotypical feminine and masculine ways of being. And there we are. Like we can continue to talk about it, but toxic, no. Right? Uh, by comparison, so men are on average bigger and stronger. And so when they go toxic, when they go off the rails, they are more likely to go physical. And Society-wide, it is easier to point out and to make rules against physical violence. And so toxic masculinity, actual like violence, is relatively easy to call out. And you know, what the Me Too movement could have been was an um, empowering of people to actually call out real harassment and worse when it happens. Um, Me Too went off the rails when it could have done good, in part because of what actually can be toxic in women. The same way men can go violent, few of them do, but it's bad. Women are much less likely to go physically violent, or on average smaller and not as strong. Of course we're not as likely to have used physical violence as our weapon, right? Men are more likely to have used physical violence as their weapon when they went violent. Women are much more likely to use wiles and sexuality because especially for young women, that is where their power is. And young women have such vast power over basically every other demographic, at least in American culture, in, in some cultures like in, the, in the Far East where elders are respected more. This is not, this is not gonna be the, the same kind of dynamic, but um, 
in a culture that has a tremendous amount of freedom to express yourself and your identity how you want to, anyone who is, any young woman who is at all close to the beauty norms for her culture, and that is, it's probably less true than it used to be, um, but it, it used to be most women from, you know, I don't know, the ages of 15 to 30, something like that. Um, and, you know, our, our diet and big pharma and such have, have messed with that to some degree. Um, but most young women have had the revelation, sort of whether it's waking up one day or emerging over several months of, I now have a way of moving around in the world and of controlling people that I never had before. And wow, that is something that I don't even know what to do with. That is a power. And most women figure out how to deal with it, I think, and you know, make some mistakes along the way and you know hurt some people but you know it, it it all works out in the end people hurt each other in relationship with one another um, but there is a particular kind of i'm going to be as explicitly sexual as i possibly can be and then cry foul when anyone but perhaps my t intended target or maybe even anyone uh, says anything to me that reveals the truth that we all know which is that you are explicitly sending sexual messages constantly and drawing the attention of all the straight men in the room and affecting what everyone else can do. Why are we not allowed to say this? It's, you know, in any room where there is a beautiful young woman who is actively exposing her sexuality, either through, um, you know, phenotype or behaviorally or usually both, it's the elephant in the room. You never talk about it. You never, ever, it would, it would, it would be rude. Oh, you're not allowed to do that. That's just her choice. Well, but isn't, isn't she also changing the dynamic for everyone? And is that less dangerous than a dude who threw a punch? Yeah, in the moment, the dude who threw a punch can be stopped and like, don't do that. On the other hand, this thing, just like the authoritarian nonsense on the left, is accepted. It's culturally accepted. And the authoritarian nonsense on the right isn't culturally accepted, mostly. And physical violence for men isn't culturally accepted, mostly. Another factor in that you say it's culturally accepted is, and I've had this exact argument where I've tried to make the point that women do have sexual power. I've had people say it's not possible, that the nature of the patriarchy means that they don't have power. And I, I, I thought, of all the of all the places where women do have power, it's surely in the sexual realm. Right. No, and 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 always have, and you know, the, yes, rape is older than humans. You know, there are other primates rape and are raped, and it's awful, and it's true, and it's never going to end completely, but it is becoming more rare uh, as we actually reveal that you know women are are fully human as well. You know, every culture that actually has um, actually, the less inequality between men, the higher the rates of monogamy and the less violence against women, and the less, frankly, patriarchal the culture is. Uh, the more inequities in status between men, the more likely there are to be very powerful men who actually control everything, um, very disempowered men who have almost nothing, and all of those women who are, if they're straight and they're looking for mates, trying to get with the few men up here and not the few men down here. And that's not a stable or good society. It's just, it's just not. And so, you know, Jordan Peterson got a lot of flack for his um, comment in a different New York Times article about um, enforced monogamy, right? And I read that article and went, oh, Enforced monogamy, that's really not a term we use much. But it is a term over in evolutionary biology, and it's a concept in evolutionary biology, which is to say monogamy is enforced by women. Monogamy, when it emerges as a social system, as a mating system, as it has in not very many mammals, lots of birds, for reasons that we won't get into here, but I, I find fascinating anyway, 
Um, when mo monogamy emerges, usually out of a polygynous system, that is in which a single male mates with multiple females and therefore there are a lot of males who don't have any mating opportunities at all, when monogamy emerges out of a polygynous system, it is almost always when we can figure it out, when the animal behaviors can go in and figure it out, um, the women who are enforcing the monogamy, who are preferring a world in which there are pair bonds and one-on-one -on -one partners and therefore, you know, help with childcare and just having, you know, partners for everything going forward. To the degree that enforced monogamy is a thing, it's enforced by women. It's not enforced by men. And you know, I know for sure, I haven't talked with him about it, but I know for sure that that's, that's what Jordan meant by that as well. Um, one of the interesting side effects of this conversation not being had in the mainstream and so many things being off topic for the mainstream is that, and I wasn't really aware of this until started doing films about sexual dynamics and men and women after Me Too and some of these topics that we've covered, this huge, uh, this huge um, group online, sort of a different kind of, you can say Mugtow, men's rights activist, like the, the center of gravity online, especially on YouTube, is, is very different from the mainstream conversation. Mm. And it seems that because that conversation is not allowed to be had, the conversation around women's sexual power, for example, mm -hmm. the only place it exists is online and it often goes very toxic. Yeah. It's not women can behave in these ways, women are people too. It becomes women this always women behave. Yeah, yeah, women always behave in these ways. Women will always look for a man who's better than you etc etc and it, it's fascinating it's like if this because this conversation is not in the in the sunlight it, it often goes toxic and then goes really septic it seems oh I think that's exactly right and I think that's very much what's happening over you know so on on the on the extreme right you've got people making uh, population level claims about women and on the extreme left you have people making population level claims about all men and both of them are wrong and not to say that um, you know all men aren't more likely to display uh, the horrors that some men display than they would be to display the horrors that some women display while still being very, very unlikely to do so. Uh, but I, I do think that this is this is why this is why I wanted, even though I hate the terms, this is why I wanted to make sh you know help make sure that there was a term to mirror the one that is being paraded around on the left. If toxic masculinity, then okay, toxic femininity. And you know what, in both cases. Hoping that they cancel each other out. Right, <laughs> yeah, can, can the eight of you over here and the eight of you over there um, just you know get together, do your awful thing to each other. Can we lock you in a box together and then open the door in two years and either you're better or you're dead, <laughs> you know, something. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's not, it's obviously not everyone. And it's not a majority in either group. And the mistake is imagining that, you know, just to take, to take the, the masculine side for the moment, we can do it with both, to imagine that being interrupted in conversation, as a woman being interrupted by a man in conversation, I'm going to jump to, wow, you're capable of rape, aren't you? N no. Those are different things. A woman, let's see, how can, how can we do it for the, for the female side? Um, you know, two women get together and talk about what happened at an event the night before. They're gossiping. Oh, well, then you're going to uh, abandon your husband as soon as uh, you know, a better guy comes around and use your sexual wiles to capture someone with more money. No, most, most women don't do that, and most men aren't and wouldn't be uh, and couldn't be rapists. But in, in both sides, there's, a, there's just no, there's no good faith left, I think. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've mostly not seen the, so you pronounce the acronym, MUGTOW? MUGTOW. Yeah, um, and, and MRAs. I, I mostly haven't seen those discussions because the few times I've gone in, they are so, they are so toxic. Uh, and, and so awful that I just haven't spent time there. But I, you know, I do feel the same way about in, deep in, over in, in authoritarian left space. It's not, yeah, it there aren't the same kinds of incitements to violence, right? But, 
but it's just as awful. One of the phrases that I wasn't familiar with until we started making films about this topic was hypergamy. I didn't really know what it meant, I had to look it up. Um, but also it it's, tends to be used as a kind of catch-all conspiracy theory by a lot of the guys sort of in the more Mugtow, MRA type area. Mm -hmm. Hypergamy meaning that a woman will always look for a, a mate who's above her in status and it's used as you can never be certain with a woman because she will always she's look for always someone. She's always looking elsewhere. Yeah, she's always yeah. looking elsewhere and she can't yeah. help it, it's in her nature and men, you have to be aware of this. Um, what, what do you make of that as an evolutionary biologist? Yeah, um, you know, there, there are things that men and women do that are evolutionary and not symmetrical and not universal but still sex specific. And hypergamy, while not a, a, a super common term in the literature, is, is a term that emerges from the evolutionary literature. Um, and it, it does it does touch on a reality, which is that uh, throughout most of pre human prehistory and recorded history as well, precisely because of the sexual power that a young, specifically through much of history, a young, you know, very young unmarried woman had, um, she, for a very brief moment in time, had a chance to increase her lot in life greatly. And at some point uh, that, that window was going to close. And so she and maybe her parents, maybe her extended family, depending on the type of society that she was in, were looking for the absolutely best bet. And so how might that manifest in a modern sort of mating and dating scheme? A young woman who is well aware of her own um, sexuality and that she's in her prime and who every time she walks out the door has eyes on her, which frankly, you know, young Young women just have eyes on them all the time. You just, you, it's hard not to know how much the world is looking at you. If you, if you know, even if you're not exposing yourself, just if you are of a certain age, and and like I said, it all fit sort of the beauty norms for your for your culture. Um, is are are women going to be aware of those eyes and uh, and potentially? Uh, looking for an improvement in their lot, perhaps, is what's, so what's the counterpoint? What's, and it's not, it's not symmetrical, it's not a mirror image, because male and female are not mirror images of one another at all. Well, the counterpoint, I would say, is um, the trope from literature and from reality and from everything in between uh, that women, upon having raised a man's children to some level of independence, uh, will find themselves without a family as he goes and um, finds the, the next newest 20, nubile 20 year old, right? Uh, that, uh, that men stick around through, you know, for a, for a relationship until they now have the kind of power that uh, you know, men's power grows over time and women's sexual power anyway uh, tends to decrease, decrease over time. So at the point that those lines kind of cross, men are much more likely to overturn relationships and find someone else who looks like their wife did 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, so are both of those things true? Do they happen? They do. Uh, is it everyone? No. Is it a risk? Yes. Uh, does it you know, does it warrant the idea that this is what all women do? No. Do, are all men going to th consider or actually abandon their wives at the point that they aren't hot young things anymore? No, they're not. And you know, most men don't. Uh, so um, just like most men don't behave that way, most women don't behave that way either. Something that just came up when I'm thinking about these sort of two perspectives is in both of those perspectives, the other sex is seen as the enemy in some sense. And in fact, we should be collaborative. And we are. I mean, we, we are when it works. Um, sorry, I interrupted you. No, yeah, I was going to say, in, in both these perspectives, there's, there's sort of an implicit or explicit assumption. It's certainly implicit in a lot of sort of feminist theory. Like if you, if you, picked, yes. apart, if you yes. picked apart the Kathy Newman interview, as I've seen some people do, yeah. there's an implicit assumption in a lot of her questions that men and women are pitted against each other. Right. And 
if you go on to sort of the more extreme ends of the the, the male dominated manosphere, there's this explicit yeah. well, women Mugtow. will yeah, yeah Mugtow, that yeah, yeah that's women are yeah. that our interests are not aligned. Yeah. They're essentially so different that we can't even exist together. Right. Uh, what do which you make is, of that? Uh, it, it seems nuts to me. And in fact, if we are if we are thinking explicitly evolutionarily, what we have in our past, as what most um, long-lived social living primates have, are uh, two hierarchies within any group. And there's a male hierarchy and there's a female hierarchy. And it's confusing now <clears throat> when men and women are both doing you know, work together that isn't inherently gendered. And so that, that has confused a lot of what people think they know about how it is that we're supposed to be interacting with one another. And, um, and the fact that in some workplaces, you know, the, the fact that s actual sex can come into, like the, the prospect of sexual relationships comes into workplaces is also very confusing. But overall, women are much more likely to be competitive with other women and men with other men than men with women. That men and women tend to be tend to have interests be they sexual or not and i think um i mean in fact I and mean, this is this is a bit off topic but um you know as as a as a happily married person myself it's just easier it's it's far easier to walk into relationships with 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 new men like okay i, I know that whatever we're doing um there's we don't have to wonder like is is it this other thing it's not like you guys like you're here in my home with my husband and like you talk to him first like that's that's where we are that's not what we're doing um so we can have a relationship that hopefully is you know a bit more like it might have been between two women or two men but because we're not actually the same sex maybe we can actually do it without the combative combative stuff like more easily maybe even than two men could or two women could whereas we should expect that men are all, you know, always sizing each other up to some degree, and women are always sizing each other up to some degree. Uh, but uh, it's, it, should, it should be a different, less fraught set of interactions between men and women in some regards. You mentioned that we used to have hierarchies, male hierarchies and female hierarchies. Yeah. Is or are a lot of the problems that we're seeing at the moment, a lot of the difficulties, the result of bringing those hierarchies together? Yeah. Could you explain? Yeah, no, I mean, this, this is, you know, I, I wouldn't go back. And, you know, I've, I've, talked, I've talked with some very earnest, actually, young people. It's like, can we just go back to the traditional roles? I was like, God, no. Like, I, I would certainly love for us to, to once again celebrate mother, full-time motherhood, if that's your choice which seems to, many young women seem to not imagine that that's even on offer for them. Uh, but it's ne it would never have been what I would have wanted. And the idea that we should go back to a world that is prescribed in that way, that is circumscribed uh, for women in the domestic sphere sounds, uh, sounds confining at best. Uh, so I'm extraordinarily grateful and that's very new. But it came with a lot of chaos. It came with a lot of destruction of, of sort of an understanding of, okay, there are men's spheres and women's spheres, and women's spheres weren't entirely domestic. There was plenty of, you know, there was plenty of empowerment, um, but having men and women do mostly separate work kept relations between the genders much simpler, I think. Um, and so this is, this is an unexpected effect of maybe first wave, second wave feminism. Most of the effects for which I'm grateful, this is a mess and it's not clear how to carefully get out of it. Although it is clear that those extremes on both sides are not the right way, wherein you demonize an entire population and try to get them to subjugate themselves to you and your whims. Uh, or else they're going to keep yelling at them. That's not going to help. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you, David. <laughs>